Welcome to a brand new episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener. On this show, every week I sit down with a successful entrepreneur or investor to decode what they've mastered, digging deep to uncover the insights, ideas, and perspectives that can take us all to the next level. And today, I'm excited to share my interview with Everett Cook. He's the CEO and co-founder of Rogue Business Banking. And they're building the business bank of the future, one that's designed for fast-growing companies, one that combines software and financial services, and one that's built for collaboration, which is not traditionally something you think about in the context of banking. And in this interview, we explore Everett's background in macroeconomics and hedge fund investing, his pivot from being an investor to becoming an entrepreneur, why Roe switched its focus early on from high-end personal banking to business banking, and we talk through some of Everett's frameworks for building a large business, including thinking in asymmetrical bets, accumulating a competitive advantage, and why they think it's so important to combine incredible customer service with cutting-edge technology. As always, visit outliers.fm for the full show notes, for links to everything discussed, as well as the full transcript of this conversation. And please, if you enjoy this episode, share this with just one friend or leave us a short review on Apple Podcasts. It helps others find the show and it helps our show get more listeners. Now, let's jump into my conversation with Everett Cook. Today, we are super fortunate to have Everett from Row Bank here with us on the podcast. Everett, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on Outliers. Hey, Daniel. It's great to meet you. So I wanted to start by just asking you to share, you have a super interesting background. You've spent a bunch of time on the investing side before switching over to the founder side and founding Row. So I wanted to ask just to start, if you could give everybody listening just a quick kind of thumbnail sketch of your background. Absolutely. So I spent about 10 years on Wall Street in the investment world before leaving to found Row. And I left for a couple of reasons. I was always like fascinated with the fintech world and what was happening there. I was fortunate enough to have a couple of close friends that were really early sort of pioneers in that space in the early 2010s and sort of admired what they were doing from afar. And I also was somebody that really loved building things in any capacity. That started out from like a young age when I was like started companies as a kid, most of which didn't go anywhere. Actually, all of them didn't go anywhere, but learned a lot through that, starting with like I started a web hosting company when I was 14. I started a concert company when I was 18. I worked on a bunch of different like little projects. And you know, that was kind of what I did with my spare time. I missed that when I was investing. I missed that sense of building and building, creating something and sharing it with the world. And so when I had the opportunity to leave the investment management space and build something, I was really excited to be able to do that again because it kind of never left me. I think that's true for any entrepreneur. Like Once you get that feeling, it's really hard to go back, even if you try to suppress it for a really long time. It was tough. I really actually loved the investment world. I loved markets. It was like a true passion of mine and is sort of a, you know, the world's greatest game, in my opinion, is something that you can spend your life trying to incrementally get better at. But that was like, yeah, sort of a quick overview to what I was doing prior to building Row. Yeah, I love that at an early age, you were kind of tinkering. Was the idea there, because you know I did something similar and just had kind of these goofy business endeavors that I did early on in my life, which you know I still, I feel like it's just wonderful to start learning earlier rather than later. And you know to kind of give in to your interests and curiosities and not have that nagging voice, it's like, you're too young, this is silly, kind of beat that down. Well, what do you think you took away from those early experiences, if anything, that's kind of continued to play a role? It was really important. It was funny for me. I think the biggest thing I took away was that it's possible. And that's not something that everybody gets. And I was lucky enough to learn that very early in life, both from just trying stuff and from growing up in an environment where I was able to see other people that build things that were much larger than themselves. Once you realize that it's possible, you realize it's possible to change the world. You realize it's possible to, if you don't like the way that something works, that you're probably not the only person and you might be the person to build something better. Once you realize that it's very hard to go back, I think, and it's very hard to unsee that. And so just understanding that sort of igniting something within me that never really stopped. That's such a wonderful perspective. And I love just that takeaway that it's possible because it really does all start with just that super basic realization that like I can do it. (laughs) And if I can do it, then, you know, you're kind of in the game and then you can start getting better at it. I think a lot of people, and especially at a very young age, like people build up this image of entrepreneurs as very different than you and I, especially the people that are, you know, at the top of sort of the league table, right? And like, think about like the Fortune 400 or, and obviously like those people are super, super talented and clearly the best at it. But fundamentally, they aren't different. And they did all start with an idea. And understanding that it's not some like supernatural power and it's not something that is gifted to somebody, there's going to be winners and losers in that game. But fundamentally, like it's a game that is accessible, something that was eye-opening for me at a young age. But I think once you see, you can kind of never unsee. 
No. And I just love that perspective. And I think that's something that I've always had is just this sense that if you have something that you're interested in, the sooner you can move from kind of being on the outside looking in, which just has a bunch of distorted reality <laughs> features with it. And the sooner you can get some skin in the game, it really does demystify it. And then I think the other thing too, is as soon as you are actively doing it and you're around other people that do it, you suddenly realize that the realities of the day to day and what the job actually involves are so wildly different <laughs> from the success story. <laughs> totally. It's not as glamorous. It's not as much fun as it looks, but it's as rewarding for sure. Yeah. And everyone is just winging it. And I've always taken, you know, immense comfort from that reality. I mean, it's kind of right. In some ways that that's right. But I think more specifically, it's that you're, you're making iterative steps and trying to be deliberate about that. You can start at a problem where you really don't even know what the right questions are to ask. But as you move forward, each step gets clearer and incremental. And I think it's the challenge is always breaking it down from this. How do I go kind of a hundred miles to, okay, like what is the first step? And am I pointed in the right direction? And if you're pointing in the right direction, then each one makes sense. It's logical, but it can be like, how did someone build a company that's worth a hundred billion dollars? How did people build this technology company that is so transformative? It can be overwhelming, but if you work backwards, it starts to make sense. I think that's such a great perspective. I'd love to transition a little bit and spend some time talking about investing. And one of the things that I love that took away from the call I did with you were kind of planning out this interview is just a great quote where you said, investing is finding out how the world really works. And I love that perspective. That's how I've related to and kind of thought about investing in a lot of ways. Can you expand on that and just maybe flesh that out a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what drew me to it in the first place. And I think it's true regardless of which sort of market or part of the investment world you're within. For me, I was in macro, which was just a passion of mine in college. And I followed it after college. It was kind of amazing that you basically got paid to be a amateur macroeconomist slash handicapper slash prognosticator. And it was like crazy to me that you could actually get paid and potentially get paid really, really well to do that job. Because yeah, what it is, is it's basically... You know, trying to understand how the world works, trying to understand if X happens, where is Y and what does Y happen? And it's equally like an understanding of human behavior and psychology, as well as an understanding of like systems. And again, like that's true if you're a venture investor investing in startups. It's true if you're like a macro investor betting on where interest rates are going to go or where like broader markets are going to go. The better you get at that, the better your bets are going to be. And the way you get good at that, in my opinion, and from working for some great people and trying to learn as much as I can from them, is really by reducing that decision-making process into as few important inputs as possible. So understanding that the world is a very complex and noisy place, but there are patterns to the way that things evolve. Each instance in markets is different, but there is a consistency that is logical, right? It is a collection of people that are acting logically or based on what they believe is logical to try to make the best decision for themselves, whether they're economic actor or whether they're market participant. And so how do you like unwind that to try to understand, okay, where are we today? And like, where do we think we're going? And then layer on the second layer of, okay, where do I think we're going versus where does everybody else think we're going? And where do we think that there is a delta between the two that is worth a bet? Yeah, I love that framework because that was one of the questions I was going to ask is, you know, especially for anyone who's top down or is coming at it from that kind of macroeconomic point of view, it seems like there's an overwhelming amount of data and overwhelming amount of opinions and overwhelming amount of historical context. And it feels very difficult, at least for me in the way that I think about the world to try to tease that apart. So I'm curious, we don't need to go through a super fine grain example of that, but at a high level, can you walk us through how you would go about deciding what the critical inputs are? Because that process to me seems both super important, but also I don't even know where to begin. So I'm curious, there's an example where you can kind of tease that apart a little bit. I mean, I would always try to perform like informal walk forward tests, just like a statistical technique, but it's not very complicated. You basically go to the same way that like, if you think about, you know, performing music, right? Like you're going to play someone else's song before you start songwriting. It's like a better way to learn than just saying, I'm going to start writing music and have never even played a song before. So I would study history a lot and you understand moments in history, try to understand like what you would have known ex ante at a particular given point in time. And would that have informed what happened in the future? Or would that have informed how you would have made a decision at that point in time? And you have the benefit of a hundred years of like pretty good data or at least 50 of pretty good data. And so you can try to test your assumptions that way. 
And if it doesn't work, go back and understand, okay, what else could I have known at that time? You're not going to have like omniscience and you're not going to have future knowledge. But as you hold those assumptions constant, you start to understand, okay, like actually these are constants that make sense. These are constants that it's different each time. And understanding that is like the second part of it. But overall, like there's a pattern to the way that the world works. And it's just about testing those assumptions kind of logically and sort of rigorously. But again, you don't need to do this in R. You don't need to do this like mathematically. Like you can just sit there and think and read and say, okay, like where could I have known what was going to happen before it happened? That's sort of where you're seeking for signal in the middle of a lot of noise. And again, I think that's very true across investment styles and across markets and even across timeframes where you're trying to just understand that. But that was how I always found like was the best way to learn. I learned from great people, but nobody sat me down and said like, this is how the world works. Everybody is kind of forced to figure that out on their own. And for me, it was like, okay, like, well, like, I don't know what the future holds, but I know how things played out historically. And I love that perspective because it seems much more practical than you would expect. It feels like sometimes when you listen to people sharing a perspective or walking through something at a macroeconomic level, it doesn't sound very iterative, experimental. I guess, well, hearing you walk through that gives me a sense for how that plays out. You know, I'm curious, just one last question on that, because this is another area where I feel like, you know, there are a lot of voices if you tune into that space in kind of the macroeconomic field. And it feels very hard to know, I don't know, who to trust or who has an interesting perspective there. Are there any figures? Figures or firms that you look to or think like they have a really interesting perspective or they typically have an interesting point of view? There are definitely. I think with the caveat that nobody is, you know, is right too much of the time. But I think that firms that I really like when I was in that space, really like the work that like Richard Koo did, even though he was like pretty wrong on a bunch of stuff, but I had like a really strong framework for thinking about a lot of the macroeconomic problems that we were facing as a society and in markets post great financial crisis. I also really like admired and respected the work that the folks at Bridgewater did and thought about the world in a extremely like robust and clear sort of way. I think that there's a ton of hyperbole in the space. And if you like turn on TV or CNBC and you see a lot of people like making predictions and stuff like that. And as someone that was a practitioner in the field, like you're not really supposed to make predictions. You're supposed to handicap what you think is going to happen. But you never see people on you know CNBC saying, I think that there's positive expected value in the fact that the market is going to rally, right? Say the market's going to go up or the market's going to go down or interest rates are going to go up or interest rates are going to go down. That's not really that helpful from an informational perspective. So it's always about, I think, understanding and thinking about things probabilistically. And look, I think in startup world as well, it's very similar. You're playing a game of incomplete information like poker, and you're never going to drive towards certainty. If you drive towards certainty, you've probably spent too much time. And frankly, like you're probably wrong. It is, you know, how do I get enough information where I can make a bet that I think has positive expected value and manage my risk of ruin, like accordingly. And again, that's kind of something that you know, is a really common concept in poker. It is really similar in startups as it is in markets. I love that you brought up that CNBC point because it's definitely, I don't think you're going to find your way onto CNBC if you want to handicap your predictions and help give people a broader framework of how to think about that and how to incorporate that into their models or perspectives. No, it would be super boring. Yeah. And it would be a lot of ifs, ands, and and buts. But I also love that you brought up Bridgewater because I agree. I think there's you know also a lot of hyperbole around Bridgewater, but I've always found their perspectives and research and writing super profound and interesting and, and definitely robust. And one thing I was going to bring up there is Ray Dalio published it, although I think it's technically all was done by Bridgewater, but there's a book that they put out all about big debt crises over time. And I've got that at home and I was just opening it up over the weekend and I was like, oh, I'd love to start kind of making my way through this because it, in a lot of ways, it seems timely to <laughs> What we're experiencing at the moment. And it, for anyone listening, first off, the book's incredible, but it's also super daunting. But man, you open up that book and just the amount of research and nuance and historical context that they pulled into a single book is staggering. It's remarkable. <laughs> yeah, they're really comprehensive. I wish I was as good and frankly, as like well-resourced in terms of team as they were. Because I mean, yeah, they don't get it right every year. And I think last year was tough for them, but they have the track record to prove that. And I think that they think about things in a really structured, way. Problems that, frankly, most people don't think about in a structured way, including in markets. In spite of it being 2021, there are a lot of people that are kind of guessing. And that's okay in some instances. Like, you know, there is important knowledge, I guess, in your sort of subconscious. But supporting that with super well-researched and tested logic is like definitely something that they do really, really well. 
Yeah, and I love that term that you pulled out there of structured thinking. I think that's super important. So I'd love to pivot now from kind of investor to founder because you've made this transition. You know, I've had a few other guests on the podcast that have made this transition. And I just find it fascinating because I think that founders that have an investor background bring just a different perspective and kind of set of mental skills to the table. But it's also something where I think as an investor on the outside looking into companies, and again, going back to this starting businesses early on, you can kind of have some perspectives that are a little distressed. So I'm curious, as you made that transition, were there big surprises? Were there any big aha moments that you had as you kind of moved from investor to founder and with a lot more intensity than maybe you had previously? (laughs) Yeah, completely. You know, I think coming as an investor, your job is generally to think and to generate ideas. And so I think actually like it gives you a huge leg up when you're thinking about where is there an interesting business model? Where is there an opportunity to disrupt or think about a market or a segment very differently than other people? I think when it comes to building, it's harder for sure. Like, I mean, I'm not an engineer, I'm a non-technical founder and definitely there are engineering challenges. I was like, oh, that shouldn't be that hard. And you know, the opposite is very much true. I was really fortunate in so much as I was able to, first of all, I had what I thought was a decent understanding of my strengths and weaknesses and was able to partner with an outstanding co-founder who was able to complement that and is really just a phenomenal operator and builder. So when I would come to him and say, we should build this, it should be really easy. And he was able to say, no, that's not easy at all. We should not do that. And then we have to rethink it and figure out the best way to kind of approach it. But I would say coming from like an investment world, generally, or coming from like a different background, the most important thing is to surround yourself with great people. And that's probably the thing that just important as a founder in general, right? That's kind of my number one priority at Row is to build a phenomenal team full of people that, that complement each other's skill sets. But yeah, there's definitely things that you overestimate or underestimate, frankly, too, and things that you think might be really hard that are actually not that hard when you're coming in from a different perspective. Yeah, just on team quality, you know, I've always found that and it's incredibly difficult to do that consistently to make sure that you've got just incredible people around you and incredible people in the right roles. But when you are able to do that, it solves so many challenges. It's like the meta solve that <laughs> just makes everything easier and more enjoyable and more fun. You know, I'm curious, one other question in that vein is you talked a little bit about structured thinking, the approach you take in investing and how you approach that job. And I'm curious, where do you focus and spend your time as a founder versus an investor? And are there any, I guess, primary differences there? I'm sure structured thinking still plays a role. I'm sure mental models, I'm still sure, you know, kind of using it as thinking about how the world works. But can you talk a little bit about your focus and how you spend your time as a founder and company builder? Yeah. I mean, I think there's some of that, but it's definitely a small percent. It's a lot at the beginning and then a lot less as you go forward. And then as you go forward, it's more about, at least for me and my limited experience, it's more about making sure that your team is aligned around those objectives, that you're really, really clear and concise in terms of removing noise, removing distractions, focusing on a single goal and maintaining a super high standard for both yourself and for your team. One kind of good thing about, I think, the investment world that is helpful from a management perspective, and certainly like hedge funds are not the best people managed places in the world, generally speaking, but is that like you understand high performance environments and you understand how people work in high performance environments. And that's helpful in terms of like thinking about how do you build a high performance team? The high performance people are substantially more productive than sort of lower performing people. And it becomes a self-reinforcing ecosystem, right? Where really high performance people want to work with other really high performance people and high performance organizations, frankly, like make more money. Therefore, you're able to pay your people better. Therefore, you're able to attract more high performance people. The caveat to that is you have to be somewhat disciplined in terms of sort of policing that and in terms of preserving that. Sort of like one of the firms I worked with was outstanding at that. And I think that was the primary reason for their success was they were able to just attract the best people in the world and make sure they were really happy. That's what we're trying to do at Row as well. Very different space, very different vertical. But fundamentally, like we believe that if we do that, frankly, like that solves frankly all problems. So I had one more question on the investor turned founder side. And that is one thing that you said we were chatting before this interview is just this idea. And this is definitely an idea that's rooted in investing is when you're a founder in a business is really thinking about the bets that you're making and trying to make asymmetrical bets. And I just thought you had an interesting perspective there. Can you talk a little bit about how you take that perspective and apply that at row? Yeah. I mean, the challenge when you're a founder, that's probably different than an investor, assuming you're kind of doing things reasonably well is like you really only get 
one bet, or that's like the way to sort of think about it at a high level. In reality, that's not really true, right? Like you are constantly making bets every day with your time, with your resources, with your team. And so I think the biggest thing is to try to make sure that you're not just making one giant bet, right? You're not just putting it all in black. That doesn't mean you like spread your resources around and try to do tons of things at once, but it means that you try to move fast, iterate, and make sort of iterative sequential decisions based on information and sort of what happened. So I think it's really about like making sure that you're not basically making one big bet with whatever it is you're doing with five years of your life or something like that. And really just trying to break it into, okay, you have built a machine. That machine should be making good, positive expected value bets every day that it exists. And assuming you do that and you build your culture and your team in a way that that occurs, you really like improve your odds of overall success because you're no longer like as reliant on luck or as reliant on random events that do happen every single day. Yeah, I love that quote, that principle of just trying to every single day make the success of whatever you're doing a little less about luck and a little bit more about skill and just trying to get better at that. On the flip side of making bets, you know, there are the times where you make a bet and then midway through or at some point you realize that that's not working and you need to spin that down. Have you guys had to go through that at all at Row? And can you talk about your thought process or how you've approached a decision like that? Yeah, we've definitely had to do that. I mean, I think if you don't do that, if you've never had to do that, you're probably missing something or you're probably sticking too long with bets because nobody's perfect and nobody gets it right 100% of the time. We try to be really disciplined about cutting losses, about moving on. We try to avoid that upfront by being really deliberate in terms of like, what are we building? Test that in the market, test that with our existing customers, understand like what is going to help our customers achieve success before we roll it out. But that doesn't guarantee success and it's not perfect. And so sometimes it's just about deprioritizing it from a like a work perspective. Sometimes it's about like just rethinking it as a direction overall. I mean, at the very beginning, when we started Row, we made a really big change. We actually started initially thinking, conceptualizing the product on the consumer side. And we spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, how do we build the best consumer banking platform in the market? And we picked a segment like we want to go after people that are sort of mid high net worth earners that weren't satisfied with operating out of like a chase account but also weren't ultra wealthy and have private people that do all the things for them. I thought that was a really good thesis at the time and I still think it is and I think there's a couple of people that have done a really good job at executing on it. As we went into that market, we basically did a lot of customer research, we did a lot of interviews. And a lot of those people are entrepreneurs, so we had like a good sample. And what we kept hearing from them was that they actually weren't that dissatisfied with what existed today in the market for themselves personally, or they weren't that invested in like what it could be really. But they all lived in their business bank accounts and business finance stacks. And they kept telling us like, please fix that. Please like make that better. And so we dropped a lot of the work that we had done. We hadn't spent too much time on it, but we dropped a lot of the work that we did to move there because we felt like it was just a much more asymmetric bet. It was a better place to build. We could frankly do more and have a much larger impact on our customers' you know, day-to-day lives by approaching it that way. So you don't want to make those changes every day. And that's the biggest change we've made as a business. But I think if you are too anchored to a particular outcome or path, you potentially make bad decisions. Yeah, I love that story and I love that pivot early on. And, you know, I think you made a really great point there, which is if you're always making bets and you're never unwinding bets that aren't working, you're clearly missing something. I think that's a great point. You can't just have a ton of bets out in the world and not ever be assessing those. So now I'd love to pivot and really talk more about Row. And I think this tees off really nicely from what you just shared. But the one thing that popped out to me from our prior conversation is that the mission of Row is actually much more about empowering teams to work better with money as opposed to just making a better quote unquote bank or, you know, making it suck slightly less. And I just love that analysis because I think in my experience, that is much more the root of the problem that exists today than just banking overall. And it's a much bigger, more interesting opportunity set. Talk about how you arrived at that and why that's the vision as opposed to just kind of focusing on banking. Yeah. I mean, we started pointing in the direction of banking. We knew this was a really large industry that had a lot of problems with it from a user perspective, from an experience perspective and pricing and everything else. And we knew that we could deliver a better experience. But we also knew very quickly that that wasn't enough because actually like the fundamentals of banking are not so broken that necessarily deserves reinvention. We believe that what the biggest problem as we think about companies and companies that are scaling is that most financial tools for a company are fundamentally set up as like single player games. 
you have one point of entry, one point of exit. That single player is typically someone on the finance team. But that's not how companies work. That's not how teams work. And as a result, you create this really large bottleneck for growth and speed and progress that slows companies down. My co-founder, Alex, experienced this a lot firsthand when he was founding and building and growing companies himself throughout his career. And so we thought about really hard, like what is the finance stack or what is the banking stack look like for like the 21st century? It was that. It was about the way that most other software works on an organizational level, on an enterprise level, it exists to basically bring people together and to help them work together with data, with revenue, with whatever. And we asked ourselves the question, like, why doesn't anything finance related do that? Sometimes the answer is because of security and controls, but that's not a reason to not do it. You just have to think about that and build that into every facet of it. And so that's how we kind of came up with our mission statement, which is to help organizations work better together with money, because we feel like that is much more powerful than just building a better business checking account or then building a better credit card. That is what companies are actually trying to do, not just have a better account. No, I love it. And I think that it's a super interesting conclusion because in my experience, it checks off two boxes that I think a lot of mission statements don't, which is it's something that you can literally work on for decades. You know, it's a problem big enough that you can continue to push forward on it for decades. And it also feels like something that is big enough that it's not going to change. You know, it's not a super small mission statement that's going to go out of style or it's going to lose its relevance at some point in time. Both for myself and for people listening, I think it'd be interesting just to try to talk a little bit about the landscape of business banking because. I think at a high level, you say those words, you know, business bank, business bank account, people kind of understand what it is, but I don't think people understand it with much nuance. So one thing I wanted to do to kind of start that off is, as you guys were thinking about what you needed to build, what you needed to offer customers, and I'm sure a lot of this is customers telling you, maybe just start with what are the jobs to be done of a business bank? And what are the things that you've really focused on hitting out of the park that are just critical things that are non-negotiables, or that you think are things that you can add value that competitors aren't? Totally. So we have a lot going on over here, some of which you know we haven't announced yet, so I won't try to tip our hand too much. But but if you think holistically about like what does business bank do for a company, realistically, like they're in the business of storing your money, moving your money, and finding you money, whether you're borrowing it or, or whatever. And everything can kind of be boiled down to those three things, you know, from a building block perspective. So first we wanted to make sure that we were like best in class at every one of those things. We started with the business checking account and the treasury management program, which is enterprise grade, can support, you know, multi-billion dollar public companies, but is like intuitive and clear. And also like we wanted to make sure that we eliminated a lot of the fees that frankly, like were immaterial and made people feel like they were getting a nickel and dime by something that should be like just a really important relationship. That was, I think, the first step. We view a lot of those products as fundamentally as commodities. It is largely a commoditized space. How do you decommoditize it, what is fundamentally a commodity, you need to add value to it. And the way we add value is two ways, via software and via service. So it's by taking those core components and pulling them together in a way so like the whole team can work on it. You have great analytics, great visibility, and really easy like use, backed up by world-class service. We believe that companies of any scale are not simply going to click an ad, convert, and migrate to a business banking platform. It's not going to happen. That might be the way that like very small companies operate, but that's certainly not the way that like organizations operate. And we are really oriented around organizations. Sought really hard to bring in the best people to help support the companies that that come onto Row, help them understand how to use it, be there for them to think through challenges that they have. And then taking that and delivering it to customers and understand trying to understand like who is our best customer. And we found that out really early. Our best customer are companies that are growing. And that, that may sound like a little bit trite and sort of general, but it's really true. CFOs and controllers at companies that are growing, whether you're in like e-commerce, whether you're in construction, whether you're in manufacturing, you're all facing a lot of the same problems. Companies that are, you know, very small companies don't face those problems. Companies that are stagnant usually don't face those problems. Those problems come about as companies experience growth. And so orienting around that and orienting around those type customers and really understanding like what they're going through on a day-to-day basis has helped us to both develop our product and approach them in the right way. One thing there that I'd love to dig into just a little bit deeper is, you know, and you talked about it really quickly is treasury management. And one, there's like, just to zoom out and, you know, again, I don't 
I'm not sure this is even something you're thinking about, if it is probably down the road, but if we zoom out a little bit, the whole treasury management piece seems like it's getting a lot of discussion recently of, you know, are you putting a portion of that into Bitcoin? Are you putting a portion of that in different things? And at a high level, it feels like, you know, what is treasury management? It's just, we have money that we need to keep on our balance sheet that we want to make sure is held in a secure way and, and hopefully appreciates. But I'm not sure that's how you guys are thinking about it. How do you think about that treasury management piece? Any thoughts just at a meta level of what's happening around digital currencies and then any thoughts about how you guys approach that a row? Yeah. I mean, we've spent a lot of time thinking about digital currencies. We haven't offered that on our platform to date, but that's certainly something that we think about. In terms of like treasury management, I mean, it's fairly simple. Like it is, you're basically parking excess money that you have in a highly secure and safe way for future use, right? So we built basically directly into a network that allows us to drive up to $75 million in FDIC insurance for our customers per entity, which means that you know we're able to deliver more coverage to them than a traditional bank account would. And that pairs with our checking account and it's all integrated into one platform. So companies can basically put their reserves aside, move what they need on a monthly basis or quarterly basis into their operating account and still be like 100% safe and earn a yield on those funds so they can grow over time as they're not using them. So it's kind of a boring part of the business, but it's important and it's important for companies, especially as they get bigger. And then, you know, we build all that on top of like the the movement layer, right? The movement layer is probably the most interesting part because it's really where there's the most hands-on. And and movement for us is, you know, for most companies today actually encompasses like a lot of different fintech products that sit outside the banking system and bank account. And we believe that that was like a broken paradigm. We believe that you shouldn't need like five different products to basically move your company's money. You know, we continue to build very and invest very heavily in that space. But today, companies have access to global transfers at no cost, you know, foreign exchange at a really low rate. You know, we integrated accounts payable into Row and built that platform directly inside the product so that companies don't need to use a third-party product like a bill.com or something like that, which incurs additional costs, additional complexity, is another set of user permissions you have to manage, and also just slows down your payments. And as we continue to build into the platform, like that is like where we put in the most investment. From our perspective, if you think about a wire or a check being sent or a credit card being swiped, you know these are all fundamentally the same things. They're just ways of moving money, the ways of paying. And today companies have these things happening in a lot of different places, which means that they don't have really good visibility into what's happening on a holistic basis, right? I can't see what it is that Daniel's done you know, at a particular point in time, unless I'm checking all five systems and maybe you're on all five systems. So from our perspective, it's just about bringing it all into one place and building that into the banking experience that way companies like really have a single sort of you know operating system and dashboard to be able to grow. No, that makes a ton of sense. I want to talk a little bit about customer service because clearly, you know, even as just a second ago, you were describing all these different layers and all this technology that you're doing. And clearly you guys are very much focusing on the technology side and the product experience side of banking. But Customer service is also really important. And I think from someone from the outside looking in, you'd be like, you kind of scratch your head at that of like, why? I thought, you know, because I think for a lot of people, they have a slightly idealistic idea that technology solves all problems and we don't need people anymore. And, you know, clearly I don't think that's the case here. Can you just expand on that a little bit and what you've discovered? Yeah, we think a, a great banking experience starts and ends with with great customer service. Technology is there to reduce the amount of customer service that you actually need or eliminate it. You know, we know that people need help. We know that this is a complicated space and there's a lot to do. And so we wanted to make sure that you know every customer at Row is able to have basically has an account manager assigned to their account, is able to reach them directly, you know, via chat or email or other means, you know, and we get back to them as close to immediately as possible. Everybody has had the experience of, you know, trying to call their bank and waiting on hold. You know, banks are, you know, despite the, the billions and billions of dollars that they invest in technology, need customer service. And we're no, certainly no different. So I think that, you know, it is about understanding our customers and, and understanding that, that that is like not something that you should seek to, to remove from the system or automate out. You should make it as self-service as possible. And we do that, but you will never fully drop that because banking is all about edge cases and exceptions. Every company is different. Every company does things differently. Every controller, every CFO, and the best way to get them to be successful, get them to use your product the best way, get them to understand how it works the best way is to help them with that. So that's something that I think was you know, counterintuitive when we started building. Most companies in tech you know, certainly seek to totally remove that from the process. And we didn't think that was like the right way to go about it. The tech is really there to make sure that people can, frankly, don't have to ask questions, but we know that they will. 
Yeah, they will. And, you know, there are definitely times where if you're sending a particularly large wire, sometimes you feel more secure talking through that with someone in person. Is that kind of what you found is maybe it's those edge case experiences or it's when people are just moving particularly large sums of money or are doing something complicated that they really want and need that in-person support? No, it's not just that. I think it's throughout their journey as they are understanding the capabilities of the platform, understanding, you know, how best to use it. And then, yeah, day-to-day -day things as well. But again, like our objective isn't for you to have to, to talk to us, and certainly you don't have to, but for it to be there when you need it. One thing, just to zoom out for a little bit, the fintech tech space in general is just obviously undergoing. I mean, there's more competition than ever, but that also inherently means that there's more just interesting players doing really interesting things in the space. You know, everyone from like Apex and larger, more established players to, you know, Plaid, you know, even just Visa starting to, you know, use stable coins and experiment with kind of having cryptocurrencies process on their platform. So I'm curious, you're in the space much more than I am. What do you think is really interesting, either from a trend perspective? perspective or where things are headed or just players in the space that you think are doing interesting things? Just any general observations? I mean, I think it's probably if not one of, you know, one of the fastest growing area in tech for a really good reason. It's, you know, one of the largest sectors in the, in the global economy. It has certainly had some degree of disruption, but relative to the size of the market, not that much. If you think about the size of Stripe and their market cap and TAM versus like the percentage of processing that they're actually doing, versus companies like WorldPay, for example, you know, I, I really feel like we're just getting started. And I think that the investor community is is waking up to this and is understanding this, I think, pretty clearly right now. I think when we started this business in, 20, in 2018, there were a lot of question marks. There were a lot of question marks around, you know, why would people use the digital bank? Aren't people just happy with what exists today? And won't the big banks just, you know, they spend 10, you know, Chase spends tens of billions of dollars on technology. Won't they just like build a better product? Won't they just fix this? And I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, people were forgetting like the lessons of, you know, of technology just in general, which is that big companies move slow. There's an innovator's dilemma and outside perspective is, is generally the fastest way to innovate. You know, I think it's really exciting. It's a really exciting time for everybody in fintech. And we're, you know, one small part of that. I think the world is, is waking up to the fact that, you know, the traditional financial institutions that have dominated over the past 50 years are no longer invincible. And there's a better way for consumers and for businesses to basically manage their money, move their money and accept payments. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, embarrassing, but I think even just as you were saying, just getting started and, you know, making that comment that, yeah, we've seen a lot of players in the space, we've seen a lot of funding in the space, but disruption of incumbents is kind of non-existent. I mean, you even look at like the brokerage space of Robinhood and Public and eToro and some of those, and has that toppled any large player? Absolutely not. Are they still growing accounts? Are they still growing assets under management? Yes. I think that's a really interesting perspective because I think that's non-consensus and kind of a narrative violation in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I mean, not only that, like the pie is also growing. The economy is growing. The amount of money in the economy is growing. The amount of businesses that exist are growing. So it's not totally just about disruption. It's also about just growing the ecosystem overall. In the investment space, more people are investing than ever. Again, like that coupled with the fact that you've had you know slow growth and slow innovation from legacy players just creates a massive opening for companies like us and a lot of people across verticals, whether you're in the brokerage space or in the consumer space or in the payment processing space, to build phenomenal products that really serve those end markets. And so, yeah, I, I really do believe like we're in a very early phase. This is, in my opinion, the most exciting space in tech. You know, and even though I think, you know, you can kind of think of fintech as kind of really getting started in like 2010 with like all the lending companies. It's much more comprehensive now. It's much more interesting because as opposed to just slapping a UI on a legacy process, founders are really like reinventing the way that finance works overall for companies. And it's really exciting from DeFi and crypto, like at the you know frontier of it, companies like us and to more established companies like Chime, I think there's just a wholesale change in attitude and in opportunity. And I think, I think the consumer and the end user and the businesses have finally woken up to the fact that there are better alternatives out there. And I think that wasn't clear to them before. And now that they understand that, it's sort of like when Airbnb emerged versus hotels. And at first, people were comparing the two. And they were saying, Airbnb is a little bit cheaper than a hotel, so I'm going to stay at an Airbnb. And you, know, you fast forward five or seven years, and it's now, well, I'm going to stay at Airbnb because it's better than a hotel. Because I prefer to stay at a home. It's bigger. It's nicer. Even if it's twice the price, I don't care. And I think that's what's happening here. Whereas you started out with, okay, like digital products are, you know, just cheaper. And now it's like, not only are they cheaper or at least just cost competitive, they're fundamentally better. And that is what, you know, expands the market 10x. 
Yeah. And I think funnily mentally better across multiple different axes, I think is what's always really interesting. And just one other thing, just to kind of build off what you were saying to me, there's a really interesting progression that happens, you know, and even talking about fintech, maybe that disruption, and I'm sure this is not accurate and maybe someone could pinpoint this more accurately, but you know, you threw out that number of 2010 and, you know, let's take that as a starting point. And if we think about the industry, it almost feels like, you know, the first wave of disruption is people focusing on really narrow niches, you know, and developing all this kind of underlying layer of technologies and, and these kind of small pieces. And then what I always enjoy is, you know, and what I think is kind of the master move because it's, you know, you're kind of executing at more of a meta level is then you tie all those things together and you can deliver a value proposition that is fundamentally different than what people can get. And I think Rose is such an amazing example of that, you know, and kind of pulling those individual technologies and points of view together and delivering something that's totally different <laughs> and is truly 10x better. That is what we're trying to do. Like, I think you think about a lot of these pieces are, first of all, like redundant, you know, redundant from like at least a, a core perspective. And so putting them together is not necessarily building five different products, right? It is, you know, five sort of parts of a product with similar sort of internal components. And the second thing is, is yeah, like I think that there was a really strong focus at the beginning of fintech in terms of building, you know, very verticalized, very narrow solutions. And there's a lot of companies that are, that are doing that today as well. You know, some of which are doing really well. I think that we have a different approach to that and different perspective on that, which is that there is similarity across finance teams in terms of how they operate, regardless of industry that they're in. And they experience the same problems. And frankly, these are hard problems to solve. Being great in this space is really difficult. And there won't be a lot of companies that are great at it. So we actually like, you know, I think disagree with part of the sort of popular consensus that, you know, there will be banking and sort of payments and stuff like that for, you know, architects and for plumbers and for software companies and for e-commerce companies, because we fundamentally think it's just hard to be really good at it. And then we think the best product is what's, what's actually just going to win across the board, regardless of vertical. I'd add a plus one in your column. <laughs> so I think that's the, the more realistic approach to kind of how that plays out well. And that also goes, you know, I think one quote that always bubbles up in my mind is when you think about those kind of people competing in these small little areas is ultimately, you know, the player with the biggest scale, the player with the biggest network is almost always going to win because they can deliver things at lower cost. They can deliver a better product experience. And even just thinking about that, like, what is the difference if I'm a plumber that wants a bank? I, I still have money needs that are basically the same as almost anybody else. It's, it's kind of comical. That's right. We don't think it's as differentiated as people think. Again, yeah, we think quality is what ultimately wins. So I want to move on to a few closing questions. And one that I wanted to start with is, you know, book recommendations. So, I mean, talking before this, I know that, you know, you're a little time starved to be able to read. I know I, I ebb and flow. <laughs> I used to love books and I'm, I'm like, man, I haven't read a book in like an embarrassingly long amount of time because I simultaneously started a company and had a daughter, which means I like barely get any sleep. <laughs> so hopefully soon. But yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, there were a bunch of books that were really, you know, important to me and, and sort of foundational in the way that I think, I mean, I really liked when I was like in the investment world and just in general, like I, I really liked books on like performance psychology. I really thought that that was like a really interesting thing to understand about yourself and about people like and obviously a lot of that comes from sports even though i'm not like a you know a very good athlete there were a couple of books that i really liked i really loved the inner game of tennis which was kind of i think was written in like 1979 or something like that but it's sort of a classic do you play tennis i do play tennis not very well but i i, I love tennis but it's a great book about in a lot of ways touches on a lot of the same things around like thinking fast and thinking slow it's about like you know understanding your like your inner self as well as like and not letting that like get in the way of progress and understanding the duality of that i thought that was just a phenomenal book in terms of like how to drive self-improvement there's another book that i really loved kind of in a similar vein which was called the art of learning which was about uh josh wadskin who was a, a world-class chess player but more than that he described his journey through chess really learning how to learn. I thought that was, it was really cool. It's a great read. I really, really enjoyed that book. And he's somebody that I think really thinks deeply about like what it means to be great at something and how do you become great at something and taking that as a deliberate process as opposed to chance. And then I'll, uh, I'll give you one more, which is like, you know, probably my, my favorite investment book, which is the, the most important thing by Howard Marks, you know, which is just really like just full of like so many decades of wisdom and deep understanding of markets and human psychology and the way that the world works. You know, he's one of the world's greatest investors and the book is really good. So those would be my top three. 
Those are great recommendations. And yeah, I've seen Howard Mark speak a couple times and he is, I mean, just the clarity of thought. You know, if you're someone that aspires to be able to articulate the way that you see the world and the way that you think really, really, really clearly, I feel like you can't get much better than Howard Marks. Whether it's a book, whether it's listening to him talk, is he's just kind of in a class of his own. Okay. The next thing I wanted to ask about is just, and I know you're right in the middle of it, obviously, but survival tips for founders, you know, <laughs> or thoughts for someone that is listening to this interview that's maybe getting started. I don't know, just think that you've learned or things that you've changed your expectations of yourself on any feedback you'd give to people that are in that vein in that space i don't know i mean i'm i don't love giving like advice too much because i'm still in the middle of it you know i think that just first of all trying to survive that's job number one you know make sure that you're not making any decisions that will fundamentally prevent you from playing the game another day you know i think two is and this is something that i you know at the very beginning when I was thinking about building Row, or where, when I was thinking about building a company, and I had a very long list of ideas in terms of like places where I thought there were opportunity. Most of them were bad, but some of them were good. And is like understanding that there's a market opportunity isn't enough. You need to understand that like you are the right person to execute that. And that's the, probably the difference between being an investor and an operator, right? Like as an investor, find a great idea, find a great company, buy that stock. Doesn't mean you're the right person to create that company. And so like you can have insight without you know, capability. I had a lot of ideas starting before I started Row, and I was like, man, this is going to be huge. And then I spent a couple of days really diving into what it meant to build a company in that space. I was like, I am so unqualified for this, you know, <laughs> for this opportunity. It takes a lot of self-awareness. I think that, that is, it's, you know, it's trying to know your strengths and weaknesses. And I guess the third thing is like, just surround yourself with great people, especially people that like, frankly, cover your weaknesses. You know, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Once you understand them, like find people to fill in those gaps. I mean, for me, you know, day one, it was my co-founder who's, you know, been phenomenal. And, and frankly, like so many of the things that I frankly can't do, but beyond that, you know, the whole team, there's no substitute for surrounding yourself with great people. It's not easy to find great people, but as you find one and two and three, it gets iteratively easier. So don't let your standards down and really just try to pursue that at all costs. It's like compounding at work. <laughs> yeah, the pot, completely. Both the benefits and the amount of work it's going to take to go into that. Third question, this is the, the closing question we ask every guest is, if you can share a person or experience that's just had a profound impact on your life and you know, just share a little bit of what you took away from that person, what you took away from that experience and, and how you apply that today. Yeah, I mean, I think it was early on in my life you know, one of the first jobs I had was working at Bloomberg LP and Mayor Bloomberg was, was very involved. He was there every day and it was seeing like what one person or really a couple people could start. And I guess they'd been around for 15 years at that point and really how big it can get was just mind blowing to me at a, at a very young age. So it was understanding that like, even at like the echelon of, you know, company building world it is possible to do that. And, and that things that big really do start small. And he's an exceptional person and a tremendous leader in politics and in business and philanthropy. But you know, he built that and he didn't get there overnight. And these institutions that seem massive and impenetrable and you know have thousands and thousands of people, like they all did start somewhere. And that sounds simple, but it's like, I don't know. For me, that was like just an eye-opening experience of wow, like, you know, things aren't as rigid as they seem. And these things do have small groups of people that generally birth them. And that was to me really, really inspiring. It's like going full circle back to the beginning of the conversation, you know, and just demystifying and and what it's like to start a business. And just to add on to that, you know, I had a similar experience at Square from being there super early on. And I think a lot of people look at that company today and are just absolutely blown away, you know, as am I with how far it's progressed. And, you know, whether you, depending on whatever part of the business you look at it, it's just a masterclass in a lot of ways, but it started out so humbly. And it's also, I think by being that close, you also get an appreciation for the fact that these things are very messy, you know, as they progress. And companies, just like people, go through a lot of awkward growth phases and make bad decisions and, and have to reset. And yeah, I think you always just always take away from one of those experiences that one, you know, as you said at the beginning of this interview, it's possible. <laughs> and two, that it really does start out, you know, very simply and humbly. That's right. And I mean, look, there is definitely luck that gets involved and it, and it is a combination of luck and skill. And But it all starts somewhere. And that's kind of the, you know, the, the biggest thing that I, I took away and, you know, that we're trying to build it around. You're in those early innings and you know where you're headed, which is great. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, I think people are going to absolutely love this. So thank you so much for your time, Everett, and for being so generous. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. It's been uh, great being here. Thank you so much for listening to Outliers. To explore other episodes and sign up for our free weekly newsletter, visit outliers.fm. 